So, um, greetings everyone. Um, I'm Ron Stella from the Department of Central Eurasian Studies. We are happy to uh, host today William McGrath, uh, who will be speaking to us about a timely subject, epidemics in uh, Tibet and Eurasia um, from a historical and methodological perspective. Professor McGrath, who completed his PhD in the history of religion at Virginia in 2017, is currently a visiting assistant professor at Manhattan College, where he teaches Asian religions. Um, he is the author of several important articles on the intersection of religion, medicine, and history, and has edited volume um, Knowledge and Context in Tibetan Medicine, was published with Brill in 2019. Following the talk, we'll have a limited time for questions and answers. If you have any questions, simply write the word question in the chat or directly to me. Uh, we do request that you keep your questions or comments brief. So uh, Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you for the kind and flattering introduction. Um, I will keep um, the, win the videos on the right and the chat on the right open. So if I if you have any emergency questions, I'll keep an eye on it. This is how I run my class, so I'm just sort of comfortable this way. So I won't do the full screen share. It'll look like this. Hopefully that doesn't bother anybody. Um, so yes, as, as Professor Sela uh, mentioned, today I'll be speaking about um, epidemics, more specifically about religion and medicine in Tibet and how these relate to the epidemiological history in, of Central Asia, as well as the cultural history of Tibet. Um, and specific diseases in Tibet and Central Asia. I'll use um, Tibetan and Chinese language sources to show that epidemic skin diseases, as, as you can tell, I'm using kind of vague language there, but epidemic skin diseases ravaged Central Eurasian peoples from the seventh to ninth centuries. And also um, that building on phylogenetic discoveries that the Black Death of 14th century Europe also um, afflicted Tibet and the budding Mongol Empire in the 13th century and beyond. So returning finally to our present day context of pandemic diseases, I'll then argue that these Central Eurasian narratives offer not only an, what we might call epidemiological explanations, right? So just a, a history of disease, a history of how people got these diseases, which of course is an important study in and of itself, but we also gain methods for reestablishing social order in a time of crisis and restoring trust between medical professionals and their patients. Um, so seeing that our world is really just beginning to heal, you know, with the, the rollout of the vaccines and so forth, um, it would behoove us to listen to these explanations of epidemics. Um, now, just to begin sort of um, situating my work in the field, first I'll say, this is um, kind of a, a composite discussion of four different pieces. I guess I could even begin with this. Um, four different pieces that I published in the last year, I guess it has been. Um, one is a relatively popular piece. It's uh, about social media and we'll see kind of where this comes in. So this, this is not a scholarly article, but it's a, a popular piece about um, comments by Tudim Punsok, who we'll see. Uh, this uh, it was a shorter analytical piece. And then these two are, are, well, I guess this one's a translation, this one's a proper article. So these are the four pieces that I'm weaving together to make my argument today. Um, I've sent at least three of these to the, the, the committee. So if anybody is curious about kind of the, the more detailed arguments behind what I'm, I'm presenting today, I'd be happy to go into that uh, in the question period as well. Um, just to situate my work, uh, probably the single most important manuscript or, or monograph, I should say, on Tibetan medicine, Tibetan medical history is Janet Gyatso's book, which came out six years ago, uh, Being Human in, in a Buddhist World. She introduces the medical mentality, which is obviously uh, an important and valid way of, of telling Tibetan medical history. I think uh, th this emphasis on observation, on empiricism uh, is certainly, th there's evidence for that, which she argues very skillfully. Um, but at, 
to sort of evoke Galen, uh, physicians are not just empiricists, they're also rationalists, right? And so there's a certain amount of scholastic medicine that goes into this as well, right? There are systems of humors, for example, as well as elements and thermal diseases. So it's not only what we observe, right? Which is really what empiricism means. It's also these um, systems of correspondence, which um, Paul Unschuld is a phrase, we talked about him earlier. So anyways, um, the, this more scholastic approach to medicine as well, that is one way to study medicine. What I want to do today is talk about ritual healing, which for Gyatso is basically everything that's not the medical mentality. It's kind of a vague term for her. Um, I would argue it's protection from spirits, right? It's, it's basically, rather than saying disease is caused by something physiological, uh, or, or purely physiological. It's something coming from the outside and attacking us, almost like a little virus or something. But no, these are spirits, right? Spirits that attack people. And so then there are exorcisms and apotropaic techniques to protect ourselves from these spirits. So that's what I would call ritual healing. And what we end up with, um, according to this model, is basically science versus religion. And dare I say the naughty word of magic, right? Which Victorian anthropologists uh, were poo-pooing long ago, right? So this is an old model, science, religion, magic, E.B. Tyler, the Golden Bow, Sir James Fraser, right? So this is uh, an old way of thinking about uh, religion and its place in the world. And medicine is being plugged into this as almost like a proto science. Um, and you know, th there are implications for that. What I want to do, and what I think gets lost in that formulation is narrative. Okay, so narrative medicine is not a new concept. I didn't invent this concept. This is Arthur Kleinman. He made some important contributions to this in the 80s. Cheryl Mattingly is a little less famous, but more detailed in theories of narratives and how they might psychologically and therapeutically affect people. Um, Charles Rosenberg uh, is, as you can tell from my title, a major, I owe a major debt of inspiration to him. Um, where he talks about the narrative framing of biological phenomena. And that's effectively what I seek to do today is find a, a biological phenomenon within history and then try to frame cultural narratives around it. So this is, again, the kind of the overview of what we're trying to do today. So let's get into some examples. Um, COVID-19 obviously is this biological background that we're all familiar with. Um, the Dalai Lama wrote a piece for Time Time Magazine uh, last summer, and he said, prayer is not enough, right? Which is kind of a nice statement. Again, if we, if we go back to our old science, religion, magic, it's magic is not enough, right? We need some compassion uh, as well. And of course, as the Bodhisattva of compassion, this is befitting him, right? He's an expert of these things. And so he's saying we need to be compassionate to each other. And I wholeheartedly agree. In some ways, that is my argument today. So, um, so I, I want to begin with that. Uh, that being said, within the um, Tibetan community, right, so the Dalai Lama is sort of this face of Tibet looking to Time Magazine and the outside world. Within the Tibetan community, there's actually quite a bit of contestation over the place of the Black Nine pill, which I imagine most of you have never heard of. Um, Barbara Gurkha was in Dharamsala in 2020 when COVID started to take off. This is a photo that she took, um, and she has a, a publication on the Black Nine pill in the Dharamsala community. Uh, so what is the Black Nine pill? As you can tell, it, it usually comes in the sachet. These strings are tied quite tightly because it's not a pill that is supposed to be ingested. It's supposed to be worn around the neck, right around here. And the reason for that is it contains aromatic substances like musk, which of course, is, Tibet is very famous for its musk, its musk deer, which all the rest of Central Eurasia coveted. Um, so the, the musk, the theory goes is that these epidemic diseases are caused by miasma, right, which is in the air, which is probably why Americans don't like wearing face masks, because they don't like this outdated idea of a miasma. But there's a sense that the musk will waft up and protect the nose of the wearer from the miasma that will potentially cause disease. And so these uh, sachets, these pills were popular during the SARS outbreak. And now they're popular again. Um, I would argue there are medical explanations, right? To use that medical mentality, it's, it's blocking the miasma, as well as what we could call apotropaic explanations. Not everybody's thinking about miasma here. And the same with the face mask, right? Not everybody is going to necessarily be protected from the, the face mask. There is something, maybe we could say a bit more apotropaic, more ritualized about these sorts of practices. And 
a figure I mentioned a moment ago, Tipton Punsok, he's the professor emeritus of Tibetan studies at Southwest Minzu University in Chengdu, uh, recently retired. He used to be in Beijing as well. Um, he came out and said publicly in social media. So I, again, this is one of my publications is I picked up his social media feed back in January because I just thought this was a an important voice to translate for the world. Um, he said the efficacy of not only faith and devotion and mantras and so forth, um, but also traditional medicine. He says all of this is not established. We, there's no clear evidence that this works on the coronavirus. If you get sick, go to the hospital, right? Is basically what he wanted to say. And it looks like you know, we're splitting science away from religion again. And as we split the two, we're even splitting traditional medicine on the side of religion instead of the side of science, right? Which effectively is contrary to Janet Gatso's argument, right? It's saying that, no, 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 Tibetan medicine is science and not religion. I'm saying, let's not split these hairs anymore, right? I think, in fact, this is a problem when we split hairs like this. And so let's look at the good old days when these things were much more jumbled up um, and think about how we might re reimagine the relationship between traditional Tibetan medicine, ritual healing, scientific healing, and everything in between. Okay, so Princess and the Plague. This, this is my major article. Uh, it'll come out later this year. So again, very brief overview of what I'm doing in this article. Professor Beckwith, if he's in the crowd, uh, hopefully he won't ask me any too hard questions. So he, he wrote about this back in the 80s. Uh, and then Matthew Kapstein picked up on that. Uh, in his Tibetan Assimilation of Buddhism, both very important uh, works to describe Tibetan, um, the, the history of Tibetan Empire. And basically the argument goes is that there was an outbreak of the plague in the early eighth century, right? So Princess Jinshan comes to Tibet, marries the Tibetan emperor, gets sick and dies, and then they blame the Tibetan monks for it, right? That's sort of the established narrative. Kapstein makes that argument, Beckwith made that argument. Um, what I wanted to see was what are the details of this argument, right? How deep can we go into this? And there's actually quite a bit to say. Both of them were working from the religious history of Khotan. So this is the Liu Chugi Lodju. It's one of the first, I think the first, if I'm not mistaken, Lodju, which means history um, in the Tibetan language. It, it may have been written by a Khotanese person, but it only exists in Tibetan. It only exists in one Dunhuang manuscript, PT 960. Uh, and this describes a black pox, a drumnak that develops on the chest. It literally says the heart, but the chest of the Chinese princess. Um, and it screams of bubonic plague. If you know about this idea of buboes, then you know that they develop at the lymph nodes, which are in the neck, the armpit, the groin area. So to have a large protrusion, a pox, if you will, a pox mark um, on your chest, particularly if it turns black, which in my mind means necrotic, a necrotic bubo, it could only mean the bubonic plague. Um, other descriptions from a related source, the prophecy of the Khotanese Arhat, which exists in Tibetan, uh, in manuscript, also in the Tibetan canons, also in Chinese, in the Chinese canon, um, so in Dunhuang form, also in, in later uh, transmission. So this is a very popular work compared to the religious history of Khotan, tells the same story effectively, but uses different language. So we get a drum chen, it's not a drum nak, it's not black anymore, it's a great pox. Um, and in Chinese language, it's even more ambiguous. We just get a pox disease, a do chuang zhi bing, right? Which could literally translate to something like a bean sore disease, which has been used to probably more convincingly describe smallpox. And so we end up with basically an inconclusive diagnosis, right? Retrospective diagnosis is hard. Is it the bubonic plague? Is it smallpox? I've had colleagues argue with me about this and I argue with them. And, uh, we just don't know. We don't know, right? We have different sources making different statements. And we could just stop there. But as the curious scholar I am, I, I refuse to stop when it seems reasonable. And um, I wanted to read some medical texts from this time. Uh, there's a work called the Siddhasara, Ravi Gupta, probably composed it in Kashmir. There are a lot of things about this early history that we don't know. It was translated into Tibetan in the ninth century, Cotonese in the 10th. And I tried to find a date for the old Uyghur. It's, it's there by the 14th century, but we don't know exactly when. Uh, my guess is it's probably around the 10th or 11th. Uh, maybe some, someone in the crowd can help me with that. Um, and the Cotonese preface was translated by Bailey back in the 60s from, you know, again, from Cotonese. 
basically saying there was a new disease that showed up. It was unrecognized and many beings died. And that's why we needed to translate the Siddhasara into Cotonese and before that into Tibetan. So it's this pretty direct account, right? Uh, we were talking about sources earlier as well. It, it, it's a fairly direct statement, the preface to a translation written in Khotan in a space, in a time about, a, about a, a, a very specific situation where they're describing the emergence of a new disease. Now, again, I remind you, this is the ninth and the 10th century when this gets translated into Tibetan and Khotanese, not the eighth, right? Which is usually when people talk about this princess having died. So I kept digging a bit more. And of course, I, I didn't mention this, but in the Siddhasar, they do talk about drum, about drum nak and uh, various other drum, various other poxes. Um, I kept digging a little bit more. And in the colophon for the religious history of Khotan, there's talk of Vimla Prabha, uh, Drime Usur. Uh, uh, so it's this, um, this goddess who also was popular in eighth century East Asia, the Ugo Jingguang. Uh, so she had a, a great spells of Vimla Prabha that was translated um, into Chinese in 704 at the court of Wu Zetian. And the only reason I, I bring this up, it feels like a bit of a tangent, but this was the single most popular book of the eighth century, if we just want to speak of volume. It was the first extant woodblock print I'll let that sink in for a moment. The first extent woodblock, woodblock print of any culture anywhere in the world, right? That's a big deal. Um, and it was, there were thousands of copies, thousands, right? Uh, they used the word, you know, Iwan, right? Or whatever the Japanese equivalent of that. They used 10,000. I don't know if it was quite 10,000, but there are thousands of this print from the eighth century. So early, right? Eighth century Japan. Um, so why, why? Nobody has answered why so many copies of this. And I am arguing, because there were epidemics ravaging East Asia and Central Asia, and this was the figure that protects us from epidemics. The, in Tibetan language, and uh, only in the Tibetan language, there's another work called The Questions of Vimla Prabha, where the princess protects Khotan from epi epidemic disease with blessings and spells. And so you don't have to use your imagination too much to then extend this to East Asia. I'm not an expert of 8th century Japan, but if there are any out there, this is low hanging fruit, right? Just connect these two together and you've got a pretty cool project. Um, so anyways, you can read more about this in, in the article I sent you all, uh, epidemiologically inconclusive. We don't know what the epidemic skin disease was. It was probably both smallpox and the bubonic plague. In the conclusion, I actually bravely take a stand on this and I say, uh, in the seventh century, it's probably smallpox. In the ninth century, it's probably bu bubonic plague. That, that's my conclusion. Um, but beyond that, we also have narratives of blame where we're blaming monks and nuns. But rather than sort of a Trump China virus approach, it's, it's from the perspective of the accused, right? It's from the perspective of the monks and nuns who are being accused of bringing this disease. And the real narrative happening here is this language of the semblance of the Dharma age, right? So if you're familiar with Mofa or Mapo in Japan, Xiangfa is the step before Mofa. It's, it's when the, the, the Dharma is not gone yet, but it's close to disappearing. There's sort of an obscure Tibetan equivalent of this, Chugi Zuknyen. When I first saw that, I was confused. And then I found, of course, Rolf Stein has already written about this 60 years ago, right? So, um, so you, can, you can look back to find this. And uh, uh, Jan Nadia has, has a great work, um, Once Upon a, a Future Time. So anyways, um, what, what is the upshot of this? Is the Dharma is impermanent? The Buddha is gone, the, the Dharma is disappearing. That's why we get epidemic disease. That's why we're being conquered by foreign peoples. And that's why we need the blessings of Vimala Prabha in order to forestall this ultimate extinction of the Dharma. So that is one narrative world, okay? Are we doing okay so far? I've, I've used 25 minutes. So we've got 20 minutes for the rest, no problem. Um, so this is one narrative world, ninth to seventh century, sorry, seventh to ninth centuries. Here's the next one. Now we're jumping to the 13th century. This is a treasure text. I've also translated this parts of it, uh, published parts of it in 2020B, which is my uh, base of ambrosia translation. It's, it's called the Chime Dutsi Bumba, or some people call it the Chime Dutsi Bum Chen because there's a Bum Chung that shows up after it, but it doesn't call itself Bum Chen. That's mostly what other people call it. Uh, so I just simplify this as the vase of ambrosia. Um, like I said, the churning of the ocean of milk is being explicitly uh, referenced here. 
Um, and so this is a treasure text, which means Padmasambhava purportedly taught it, and then subsequent figures revealed it. It's an otherwise unknown treasure revealer uh, named Dorbum Chugidrakpa. Um, I would argue that's you know a name that gets associated with the text. It's probably a composite that was. Uh, there's an accretion. It's it's quite long. It's hundreds of pages. So probably over the 13th and maybe the 14th century as well. Um, so this offers a new narrative, right? Rather than the semblance of the Dharma age, they get rid of that, right? Rather than thinking the golden age was the time of the Buddha, now we have a new golden age, the time of Padmasambhava, the second Buddha, right? Um, and so why why is he so important? Is he exercised the demons of Tibet? He reestablished order to Tibet. He basically hit the reset button on the clock because he's the second Buddha, but he's reimagining a future time, 500 years in the future to be exact, which is approximately the 13th century when diseases will return, right? So this is, uh, I would argue, thematically tied, even though it's not explicitly tied to those Vimala Prabha narratives. And he's basically saying, all right, these poor future people are gonna have to deal with the disease here's my advice to them, right? We have medical advice, we have ritual advice. We could pick and choose one and ignore the other, but why would we ever do that, right? That's not how it's being presented here. Um, here's the narrative. Uh, it, there's sort of a Gnostic notion to it where ignorance is the root problem. Disease ripens from this root of ignorance that's familiar from the four tantras. It's familiar from basically all of Tibetan medicine during this period. Um, three or four people in the world will die. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, it repeats this number. Three out of four people in the world will die. Now, of course, did that really happen? I have no idea, but it sounds really frightening. We get Turkic armies, a fascinating word is used, Turuka, right? They could have said Hor, they could have said Sokpo, they could have said all sorts of things, but they said Turuka, a very explicit, they're not talking about Mongols. They might be talking about Turks who are working with the Mongols, which is probably what it was, um, but they're talking about Turks here, right? Turka will come and destroy the assembly of the teachings. They'll destroy Buddhism. Again, similar concern as before that Buddhism might disappear. Um, and this is an age of degeneration. Again, rather than they could have said semblance of the Dharma age or uh, instead it's a different term. It's Nyambedu, right? Nyam is, uh, is not what is used during the Tibetan Empire, it's a new way of expressing this age of degener degeneration, even though it's a, a, a familiar term. Um, so what is this disease? Maybe you can tell from my gesticulations. I think this is the bubonic plague. So it's called the Black Triad, Nakpo Sumjil. It's also called the Black Collapse, Nakpo Dukjel or Chukjel. Um, it took me some time to figure out how to translate these things, but I'm actually pretty confident with these translations. And um, you won't find these terms in more scholastic texts. These are not cosmopolitan terms coming from India or something like that. These are Tibetan terms. Uh, why is it the black triad? Is because there are three things that are causing problems. Spirits, nyin spirits, right? Heat disease or fevers. Uh, it's basically there's hot and there's cold. So it's evoking that sort of duality or wind disease, which is one of the three humors. So we've got spirits, We've got thermal diseases and we've got humoral explanations all tied up. That's what drill literally means is to tie it all together. So the black triad of these three things and it's black, right? It has this necrotic, necrotic connotation to it too. It makes my skin crawl when I think about it, to be honest. That's why I'm doing this project. We topple the mountains of Nyen spirits. What is a mountain of a Nyen spirit? If not a bubo, right? Again, I'm being a bit interpretive here, but you get this giant lump and people are wondering, what the hell is a giant lump? What do we do about it? It looks like it's charred by fire. So it uses the same term, fire skin, that we saw from the Siddhasara. And then you also treat the wind to heal the body. There's a lot more detail into it, but I, I'll, I'll cut it off there. One other piece of observation, there are observations about its spread, how it's spread from community to community, like a beggar eating in town. I'm not positive about this, but I th what I think this is saying is that Beggars would stay with one community, beg for food, eat, eat, eat. And when they're sort of no longer welcome, they move to another community, beg for food, eat, 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 and then sort of move around in this way. And the disease is moving in that way, right? You can imagine it's, it's moving, it's spreading, everybody gets sick, and then it moves to the next community. It spreads, everybody gets sick. Ah, right? Horrible, horrible. Um, we get folds like a Chinese woman's silken dress. There's also this shape of a small vase that develops. So I would argue that this is talking about buboes, a communicable skin disease, bubonic plague. Um, but we can't say for sure. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold myself to a high standard here. This is not enough to say for sure. It's pretty close, but it's not 
what we can say for sure using genetic information. So um, I think in the interest of time, I won't go through this, but there have been arguments basically. What is the origin of the Black Death? Right, all these Europeans died. We must know whose fault it is. And so, uh, de Musis wants he wants to blame the Mongols at Kaffa, right? 1346, catapulting plague bodies over to, at the poor Europeans and causing their problems. Um, Hannah Barker, do I cite her here? Yeah, Hannah Barker in 2021, just very recently, she said de Musis doesn't know he's talking about. He wasn't there at Kaffa. This is not a direct account. This is basically him um, making something up. Uh, there were McNeil in a famous work wants to say the origins are um, in the Mongol Empire, but then Boyle comes along and says actually there are a lot of errors in his demographic research. He doesn't know how to read Chinese, and so it, his conclusions are basically worthless. Um, then there's this Beijing lab that comes along less than 10 years ago, Cui, Yujun Cui, um, and they did this kind of amazing study where they took samples of the bubonic plague from all over China, and it really is all over China, even today, Yunnan obviously in Tibet, uh, but also Xinjiang and Northeastern Tibet, not so much in what we might call really the mainland, right? Not so much in this part of China. Um, I don't know, can you see my mouse? You probably can see my mouse, right? Um, they took these samples and then analyzed their genetics, right? And we don't have to worry about the details of this, but the bottom line is it's a tree. We have this branch, sorry, this trunk, which is before uh, the 13th century. Then in the 13th century, we have N07, which they call the Big Bang, where what is this sort of early strain of the bubonic plague explodes into four strains and spreads all over the world. And it's kind of a confusing date that they give. It is not the 14th century, which is when one of these branches ends up in Europe. I believe it's branch one, which is the most populous one. Um, it's actually before that. The earliest possible date, or let's say earliest probable date is 1170. And so I'm just calling this the, the turn of the 13th century. This happens, right? And what is happening at the turn of the 13th century? is <laughs> the Mongols, man, right? And so when, when people started to see this phenomenon, they just wanted to explain it really bad. And so the very next year, Bob Himes tries to use Chinese sources to do it. I, I don't want to be a hater, but it's just not there, right? It's not in the Chinese sources. Why is it not in the Chinese sources? Look back at the map, right? This is where the Chinese are in the 13th century. They're not really having this experience. It is in all the other places in modern day China that are being affected by this disease. He wants to say it's the Tanguts, but more recent studies say it's actually the Tianshan Mountains in Kyrgyzstan. I don't have a great dog in this fight about where the true origins of the Black Death are. But what I can say is that there's clearly early strains of the Black Death coming into Tibet in the 13th century. This is a fact. There's really very little way to argue about this. And now we can do a lot of interesting things with cultural history, right? I, I, I want to make a call to all the Mongolists out there. You must take the Black Death into account now. Monica Green, do I cite her? I don't think I cite her. Uh, yeah, there it is. Monica Green, 2020. Read that article. You have to respond to it now. 13th century history in Central Asia has to talk about the Black Death now. Sorry for being dramatic, but it's true. Um, so let's come back to Tibet. Sakya Pandita holds, heals Good and Khan and sets up this, um, this priest patron relationship for Tibet and the Mongols for the rest of history, basically, right? This really important moment. Again, Dr. Beckwith, if you're in the crowd, please don't hammer me on this, but he, he wrote an article about this in the 80s um, and basically concluded that this is not a real historical phenomenon. Saki Pandita did not really heal Good and Khan. Um, a Petik in his central Tibet and the Mongols just pass, he calls it a pious account and he passes over it. He doesn't really care. Um, but this term, Sadre Ne, I, I thought this is an interesting term. Let's look it up. Modeled flesh. What could that refer to? Right. Um, and so I find I found a 13th or 14th, probably 13th century medical text, just like I did with the Siddhasara. Find a medical text from that period, preferably one that is more vernacular, which is expressing the knowledge of a doctor from this period. We have one, Sangdu Dharma Gumbo, and he tells us what Satrene is. He tells us what this model flesh is. There are streaks of white, red, and blue. The inside feels abrasive. It hurts on the inside, but on the outside, it feels smooth, right? It's like kind of hard and shiny. Again, just like a bubo, and then it swells up due to the humors and blood and lymph. Pretty convincing to me, right? And especially in combination with this information, there's really no other way to interpret this 
other than some sort of swelling. It could be cancer, it could be some other swelling, but if it's communicable, then it is a bubo. Um, so let's just say, even if this didn't happen, it probably didn't happen. Sakya Pandita is remembered as ritually healing good and Khan. This is very important, right? Because we have the Cotonese during the Tang being these, um, these uh, transmitters of the Vimala Prabha uh, cult, which, as I said, led to the most popular source uh, or most widely printed source of the 8th century in the world, right? Um, and then finally, by the 13th century, we have Tibetan Buddhist masters gaining that same sort of reputation for ritually protecting Mongols and eventually Chinese and Manchu rulers from very real threats and epidemic diseases. Now, you know, I'm, I'm implicitly arguing that it's this sort of narrative that caused Tibetan to basically enter into this uh, priest patron relationship. I think that's a little overstated, but what I think is, is, is becoming clear, this disease started to spread in the 13th century and Tibetans offered tools to deal with it. And I think that is an important phenomenon to pay attention to. So with our final 10 minutes, let's jump back to the modern day. So Tibetans have this, uh, reputation for healing and protecting from epidemic diseases that continues into the present. Um, and here's a doctor from Tibet, from the, or sorry, from Dharamsala, from the Mensikong, uh, talking about the black nine pill during SARS. Unfortunately, it's spelled wrong here. It's Gub Jur, it's not Gub Chu. Um, but he's saying it was very good for business here, right? So basically there's this reputation that Tibetan doctors are able to protect us from SARS when people are scared and panicking, just like during early COVID, you know, one year ago when people are scared and panicking. So who can help us? Let's turn to the Tibetans. Let's buy some of these black nine pills. And he comes out, he's very candid. He says it's very good for business. And this is in fact what Tupten Punsok was criticizing. Um, so he, he drew this kind of crude cartoon. I'm pretty sure he drew it. I, I don't know who else would have drawn this. Uh, he uses, let, let's say, and then he wrote this poem and he says, in places devoid of contagious disease, the black nine pill is being sold. The wallets of the Tibetan people empty while physicians grow rich. If the disease uh, does arise, go to a Western hospital. Tibetan medicine has no cure for this new virus. So we see a new side to Tubtan Punso, right? He's not just saying religion's bad and science is good, right? Which is kind of a tired old argument. He's saying the unscrupulous sale of medicine during a time of crisis is evil. In fact, he comes out and he calls it evil. He, he had elaborates on this in another poem that I translated. If you have honor, dispense your medicines. If you have empathy, donate your medicines. But to exploit this opportunity to sell your medicine is an act of evil. Big pharma, right? Uh, so Tibetan physicians take advantage of this opportunity for spiritual practice. Here we have Again, the guy we were asking, you know, are, are you just a communist here? Is that really what you're saying? Science is good and religion is bad. But no, he's saying use this, use medicine as a form of spiritual practice. He's coming out and saying it. It's one thing I love about Tutum Punso. He's very controversial and he just says whatever he wants to say, right? He's not holding any particular party line. And just so we're clear that he's not inventing this or something, here is a precedent for it in the vase of ambrosia, right? Again, imagine everybody's getting sick. Everybody is scared of each other, just like New York one year ago, right? It's, it's a moment of crisis. A physician should cherish and earnestly treat the young, the old, the infirm, and the abandoned like they are one's own heart. You can imagine doctors who refuse to treat patients because they didn't want to catch this terrible disease, right? Just like our, our frontline heroes who we've so readily sacrificed to the great god of the dollar, right? Um, and so the, the physician should cherish their patients and treat them free from conceptuality, endowed with the mind of enlightenment. So of course, this is the altruistic motivation to achieve enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. Um, to, to develop divine pride, heal with love, compassion, and ferocity. Oh, powerful stuff, right? And this is coming back from the 13th century. It's important to note that this is not only exoteric Buddhism. Again, we've got our, uh, what we began with the Dalai Lama saying, be compassionate in sort of an exoteric way. There's also an esoteric Buddhism, divine pride. And this is, there are, there's an entire tantra. It's called um, uh, Dorji Gotra, the, the Vajra armor uh, or adamantine armor is an entire tantra, which is in this cycle, which tells you how to develop this, let's say ritual protection of the blue Garuda, right? And you could imagine if you're in a time of epidemic disease, you're gonna need some protection. It has this very famous line that a physician treating epidemic disease without divine pride is like going into battle without armor. 
And so this text is giving the physician armor so that they might heal their patients. Um, so finally, let, by way of conclusion, um, just a, a little bit of a summary, we've got these epidemiological narratives. This is an important part of the process, right? I wish I could tell you exactly what happened, 7th, 8th, and 9th century. I can't. I basically can tell you exactly what happened in the 13th century, though, with maybe only a little bit of exaggeration. Um, we know that there was bubonic plague in Central Eurasia in the 13th century. We know that now. And now we can layer these cultural histories, these, these other narratives, these other explanations on top of this epidemiological narrative, which I would argue is just the beginning, right? If we stop there, it's actually much less human, much less interesting. There's more to epidemic disease than just bodies and bacteria, right? Um, so what kind of narratives have we seen? Uh, during the Tibetan Empire, we had this language of the semblance of the Dharma, which is totally tied up in East Asian Buddhism, right? This idea of Mofa, Mapo in Japan uh, inspired subsequent practices there. The Tibetans decide, you know what? We don't actually like that narrative so much. We're going to replace that narrative with Padmasambhava. Uh, and so there's a new narrative, a tantric narrative, where Padmasambhava comes and exercises the pathogenic demons of Tibet. There's a power here that is absent with Vimla Prabha. Vimla Prabha will help us pray for blessings to forestall the extinction of Buddhism in Tibet, but Padmasambhava goes in with the tools that he has and he makes it happen, right? And he gives uh, future generation tools for doing the same. Those tools are then taken and used to heal and convert Khans potentially, or at least that's the way the stories go. Regardless of whether it happens or not, we still get, for example, Marco Polo's observation of the Pakshi at the court of the Khans we must ask, how did they get there? And I think we, we're beginning to see answers through this, right? It is not because Sakya Pandita was such a great scholar, although that eventually became part of it. And of course, Pandita means he is a scholar. He is be given, being given these, what I would argue, Nyingma ritual skills, right? And I, I think that is probably actually a 17th century development when the, the Dalai Lama is also taking these Nyingma uh, ritualistic skills. Um, and so finally, we end up, instead of talking about religion versus medicine, which, you know, I, I'm arguing is an antiquated position. This is basically Victorian anthropology making a comeback. Um, I'm, I'm arguing that we must talk about this emphasis on ethical care for patients. And the way we talk about this is through narrative. And let me just read my conclusion for you. So we need narrative. Um, disease is conceptualized and remembered through stories after all, and seeing that we share this history of pandemic trauma, which is what these genetic um, studies are beginning to show and is what we're living in now with COVID-19. So seeing that we share this pandemic trauma, let us also share in these narratives of restitution. We need narratives not necessarily because they are true, but because they give hope, they inspire trust, and because narratives heal. Thank you very much. So I, I finished a little bit early so we can have extra extra questions. As you can tell, I, uh, I, I, I skipped over some things. And so if, there, if, there's, if anything struck your fancy, I'd be happy to go into much more detail. Okay, um, thanks a lot. Um, so uh, we welcome your questions. If you have a question, I remind you, please uh, just um, um, put it in the chat, just a word question or just the directed uh, at me. Um, and uh, we can uh, and we can continue. So, Professor Nance, uh, you're you're first. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Great, fantastic. Thank you for that. There's a wealth of detail there and a lot to process. And um, rather than uh, taking you into the weeds and taking us into the weeds, I want to ask you to reflect on a macro level point that you made early on and return to at the end. Sure. So. Um, you said that, uh, in your opinion, religion versus medicine is Victorian anthropology making a comeback. Mm -hmm. And the way that you put this um, elsewhere in the talk was that you didn't want to split hairs like this, right? That you you preferred, and this is your word, to have things jumbled. Um, <laughs> yeah. And there's a number of things about that that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, so one thing right away, you know, you think of the distinction between a medical school and um, the Department of Religious Studies or SUS. And I would prefer to have those two things separated, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in the what, what recommends jumbling. That's the first part of my question. Mm -hmm. And the second part of my question has to do with what you would say to someone who said, well, wait a minute, religion versus medicine is something you see in Tibet. You see it in Soa Rigpa versus Nangdun Rigpa. You see it in the Pancha Vidya system in India. This isn't a Victorian anthropological 
fossil. This is something that goes way, way back and your interlocutors are making the same distinction. Mm. So what would you say about that? How would you want to um, respond to that? Wonderful. Um, so thank you, Dr. Nance. These are, these are really precise and penetrating questions. I love it. Um, so one, um, one inspiration, it's a very imprecise methodological term, but maybe you've heard of it before, is splitters versus lumpers. Have you guys heard of splitters versus lumpers before? I realize, uh, maybe I can go back to the slide. When, when I first read Gyatso, I, I hope it, it didn't show through in the presentation, but when I first read Gyatso, I was a bit disturbed by it. You know, I, I was a graduate student. Um, I, I was a graduate student in 2015 when it came out. And I was in a religious studies department and I felt like this was a direct attack on my work, right? I was trying to show medicine and Buddhism together and all of a sudden we have being human in a Buddhist world. How, how can we put these together? And I, you know, I'm a bit more mature now and I can say it really is a, a difference of splitting and lumping. You know, I use the word jumble that, that, uh, that you brought up. Um, and I, I tried to find the source of this splitting and lumping. And I think it, somebody brought it back to Darwin. Don't quote me on this, but he said basically in, in intellectual fields, it's important to have both splitters and lumpers. And um, I would agree with that, actually. So you, you brought up medical school versus religious studies department. Obviously, th these are split. You brought up classical Indian scholasticism, which, as you, you rightly point out, does show up in Tibet. These are split. So you're, you're absolutely correct. There are splitters and lumpers in the current academy. There are splitters and lumpers in traditional scholasticism as well. So no question about that. I totally agree. Um, and I would just argue that we need both, right? Darwin effectively said that, and I would agree with him. I don't mean to say we should burn Janet Gyatso's book. I think it's an incredible contribution to the field. And uh, that when I first read it, I didn't even realize it was happening at the time. And maybe I'm making myself sound like a bit of a brat, but um, she introduced this whole world of conceptual questions I could bring my archival research to. It was a total gift. It was an incredible gift, right? Um, and so I, I, there is a place for splitting. But what I tried to show in this presentation that there are consequences of that splitting. And perhaps uh, if we want to speak to our own situation, uh, I, I raised a finger at Big Pharma, right? You know, before our, our coronavirus epidemic, we had an opioid epidemic. And I would argue that this is due to the utter ethical poverty of medical studies in America, right? It's a market-based system. The values are market-based. And until we get some real values where people actually care about each other, physicians will still prey upon the sick and the vulnerable, which makes me utterly ill, right? Um, so now to, I think that speaks to the first point about why jumble is because it's not to say we shouldn't split. We should also split, um, but by lumping, we can see these connections. For example, these connections through narratives. Uh, medicine is expressed through narrative, whether we like it or not. We might have points, uh, data points that undergird those narratives. But even science, once you get off the Excel spreadsheet, you're going into narratives, right? You have to, you know, this is a, not a, a new realization, right? There's sort of the narrative turn of the late 20th century. Um, and so by lumping, we can see these narratives and see how they shift and turn across medicine, across ritual, across different contexts. Um, all right, your second point, precedence for splitting. Uh, this is something that I've, I've done quite a bit of research in, and maybe I can turn to our friend Sakya Pandita. This is why it's so interesting that he is the healer here, right? He is a splitter. If you actually read his work, he does write about medicine, but it's from a scholastic perspective. It's one short little treatise. It's a commentary on the Ashtanga Hridaya Samhita, which basically formed the foundation for um, Swarikpa, right, for, for this field of healing knowledge according to Indian scholasticism. And one thing that I'm seeing is that even in pre-modern Tibet, there is a tension between splitters and lumpers. There were those who promoted the Ashtanga Hridaya Samhita as part of Indian scholasticism, as part of the five fields of knowledge, right, which separates Buddhism from medicine. But if you turn to the most important scripture, uh, and it is scripture, of Tibetan medicine, what is it called? The Four Tantras. Who is the teacher of the Four Tantras? I don't know if you can see this, but it's my desktop background. It's this guy, right? There's not a big split there, is it, right? And so actually, they're the ones who won this argument. Saki Pandita didn't won. Nobody remembers him as a physician. It was the lumpers who won. It was the ones who said medicine, religion, bodhisattvas, divine, um, sorry, uh, divine pride, 
uh, ritual healing, bringing it all together, bring it all together through this overarching narrative as a teaching of, of the Buddha. Actually, you know what? I think I saw you respond to Janet's book where you brought up this very story, right? So I know, I know you're familiar with it, right? That it's Rikpe Yeshe talking to uh, Yilek Ye, who are both coming from the Medicine Buddha himself. And I, I just call that window dressing, right? To call that as something extra, it just means we're, we're ignoring it on purpose, right? We're passing up an opportunity to make connections between these different ideas. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. It was an excellent one. Dr. Bovingdon. Thank you, Dr. Sella. Um, really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I, of course, am not a specialist on Tibet or Tibetan medicine. So a lot of this was uh, Tibetan to me. Um, I, first of all, I will say props to you for using lumping and splitting. I introduce these concepts in every single class. You do. Uh, I think they're extremely useful. They clearly characterize much of human rational activity. Um, I'm also interested in bridging. Um, and there are two kinds of bridging. One kind of bridging I saw you doing, and I'm wondering whether you'd want to do another kind. So for non-specialists like me and for students, I presume, you bring to your written description of purely Tibetan, sometimes Chinese texts and so forth and concepts, an oral description that analogizes with contemporary events, the mm -hmm. COVID tie-in, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is clever, it keeps people aware and so forth. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether this is just to keep people oriented and awake or whether you're actually trying to compress the distinction. You're trying to elide the distinction between the Tibetan past and the Tibetan mode of thinking about medicine and so forth and our contemporary mode or are you in fact suggesting, I got hints of this in places, that we can learn something, should learn something from the Tibetan approach to medicine, whether scientific or religious or whether this is a meaningless distinction. That's number one. Number two, small one. If you look at your slides two and three, mm -hmm. this is almost breaking the rules, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Please, if you look ahead. at the lower right, mm -hmm. um, you will see a very common Chinese verb Mm -hmm. um, that is used in many exhortations. So here it's tiang wei sheng, right. right? So emphasize public health or something like that. But tiang itself is about speaking, right? Tiang li mao, tiang wen ning, and so forth, right? So have you ever thought about drawing a connection between your discussion and narrativity in Tibetan medicine with this, shall we say, narratological exhortation in Chinese? One sec. Okay. Um, let me speak to the first one. And I, I might ask you a clarifying question about the second, but I, I, have, I have some thoughts on the first one. Um, so if I understood you correctly, you're asking me, am I trying to sort of elide a distinction between past and present in pre presenting the information that I'm presenting? Um, I, it, it, is, it, it was an active choice. Um, I thought one, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to a general audience. I, one way to draw a general audience in is to begin with where we are, right? We are all in a pandemic right now. And, and to ignore that, I think is a missed opportunity. Um, that being said, I, I've already done the translation work is sort of, you know, it was, it was available. Um, and so that's another reason why I brought in. Um, but I, I think I can answer your question more satisfyingly than that. Um, Sheldon Pollock has, has an article called uh, Philology in 3D, which is it's sort of a random, or th in three dimensions, it's sort of a random little article. But um, when I read it, it just, it clicked, something happened. And it, it made me realize this is exactly what I'm trying to do. So what are the three dimensions? I wrote in, um, I think it was my diversity statement uh, it, in some material that I sent to you all, uh, where basically I said, we need to do three things in area studies, okay? One, we, one thing we need to do is history. What really happened? We have to do that, right? If, if we don't do it, we're not really doing our jobs. Obviously, if you're an anthropologist, you observe what's really happening. So you, there's some variations on that. But for me, I have to do this, uh, this historical work. Maybe we could use my slide here. We, I need to tell the epidemiological narrative, right? What were the diseases that were happening? I think that is my job, but we don't need to stop there necessarily. There's another thing that's distinct but related is what is the cultural history? Right? Um, what does the tradition say? How do, how do traditions represent themselves? And to misconstrue those representations is also irresponsible, right? And to say that one is the other is also irresponsible, right? We need to separate these two things, but also put them in conversation with each other. Very difficult to do. That by itself 
is hard, right? And I, it took a, a long time for me to figure out how to do that. The third one is really what you're asking me about, which is why, do we, why does it matter? Who cares? Um, and so I don't necessarily want to elide distinctions. This is actually where I'm splitting is uh, methodologically speaking, I think there is a historical method which tells us what really happened. There is what we could say, maybe an insider perspective, emic, edict, call it what you want to. Um, insider perspective talking about what the, how the tradition represents itself. And those are separate enterprises that I keep pretty strict boundaries between. And then the third one is who cares? Why does it matter, right? And if we mix that one in with the others, then we're also not doing our jobs, right? If we, um, I don't know, just to make fun of uh, uh, mindfulness practices or something. If we say the Buddha only taught mindfulness and no other forms of meditation, we are misrepresenting the teachings of the Buddha because all we care about is mindfulness, right? And so to take what we really care about and use that to explore the past, I would also say is irresponsible. So to do our job well, we have to do all three of these things. And so why do I bring up the present in conjunction with the past is because that is the third point, is why should we care about this? And Honestly, if we don't answer that question, no one else will care about it, right? And we will not have jobs in the future. So it, it behooves us to make these sorts of arguments about what can we learn from Tibetan narratives about disease. Uh, and I think this is one that you know Pfizer needs to staple on their wall, right? I, maybe they, they don't wanna do some divine pride practices or something, but they need to care about people, right? And if, if physicians and pharmaceutical companies don't care about people, then we're in trouble. So I, I am as bold as to say that there are things we can learn from 13th century Tibet. And I, I'm happy to be the, the purveyor of, of this wisdom. Oh, so that was the first one. Um, so the second one, sorry, I got, I was on a roll. Um, the second one, we're talking about Wei Sheng, right? So this is, uh, it, it is, I agree with you, it is an interesting word to see. Catherine Mason, uh, she has a book from 2016 called Infectious Ideas, which is about the transformation of the, uh, what were they called? Fang Yi Zhan. So there were anti-epidemic sta uh, stations, which were built on Central Eurasian models from the USSR. Uh, those persisted in Chinese public health until the 90s. And then after that, there was a transition to create a CDC. I couldn't tell you exactly what the Chinese is but it's basically built around the American model. When did this happen? 2003, right? It was SARS. And so basically after SARS, we get this quiet conversion of Chinese public health from sort of the USSR model to what is quite explicitly based on an American model. They even use the same language, a center for uh, the prevention and control of disease. So this idea that it's, we're going back to Wei Sheng here, is, it's, a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a throwback, right? It's uh, in terms of kind of public health uh, public health narratives that are operating within China. So I, I agree that it's interesting to see this. Um, in terms of what narrativity and this, uh, the idea of speaking these narratives, maybe I, I, I didn't go into too much about Mattingly, but she really wants to talk about how narratives compel meaningful action through narratives. So Kleinman is saying narratives reflect the experiences of the patient as opposed to the physician. And he even gives different terms for this. The physician diagnoses disease, the patient expresses their illness, their suffering, and that these are distinct but related phenomena and we need to see them as distinct. So he really wants to capture the experience of the patient. Mattingly takes it further and wants to say, actually, these narratives themselves, they don't just reflect how we experience, they create, they structure, they frame, they form the way in which we experience. They compel meaningful action through these narratives. So there's something inherently therapeutic about narratives, which was my concluding line for the talk, right? Is that narratives heal? So I, I tend to agree with that. Um, even if the way in which they heal, there's not an obvious method or, or mechanism to explain that. I'm not a, a psychologist. I would, I would tend to agree with this argument. And finally, Rosenberg sort of tries to do both. Again, it's putting we get the history, what really happened, what's the biological reality, then we get sort of the cultural explanation, we can see how these kind of bounce off of each other. So anyway, it's all just to say, uh, there, there's certainly room for this, if I wanted to go down a more methodological path, um, how does narrative relate to disease, the experience of the patient and the prescriptions of the physician, that could have been the, the entire talk. So I, I totally agree with you, right, it is, is how does narrative sort of interact with experience and, and our lived realities is another major question. Did I answer what you were thinking about? Yeah? Okay. All right. Very good.
So I know we're coming to a close, but I wanted us to accommodate one last question. If, if the question can be brief and also the answer, uh, Kenny Linden, please. Yes, hi, thank you very much for the talk. So briefly, um, as a Mongolist, I agree that uh, we should look at um, the Black Death and it, uh, bubonic plague continues to be a major issue in Mongolia today. Um, uh, is there a similar issue of bubonic plague still today in Tibet? And how do they frame this in regards to the historical discussion of bubonic plague? Do they say, oh, look, it's the same thing? Or does the forced secularization of the PRC um, make this not a possible um, avenue forward? Um, I know that in Inner Mongolia, there's also occasionally pops up issues of bubonic plague, or is this just not um, as prevalent in Tibet? Thank you very much. Very good, thank, thank you for your question. Um, so yeah, is there a plague in Tibet today? Yes, there is. And what plague has actually made it into the news. Perhaps you notice, um, there were cases uh, in Beijing where people went into Inner Mongolia and ate marmots, right? Like raw marmot meat and then contracted the plague that way. Um, I think one person died. It is, just so we're clear, I don't want to scare anybody. It is very treatable. If you have antibiotics and you catch the plague, you will not have these horrible fates that we're describing. But if it goes untreated, highly deadly. Um, so I, one thing I didn't get into in, in the talk, and this is something Monica Green has shown, is that uh, plague persists in marmot communities. We often think of rats in plague because that's sort of the cultural narrative that we have coming from the Black Death in Europe. But it's really marmots where, where these uh, uh, plague reservoirs are persisting consistently, right? Not like right now, uh, marmots in Central Eurasia have the plague. Um, and so anybody who's doing anything with marmots will potentially get the plague. There are marmots in Eastern Tibet. They're, they're called various different, various different words. Sometimes they're just called shiba, right? So they're just called mice, right? Or big rodents. Um, and they're, they hibernate, uh, they have fleas, uh, plague persists in their community. And one thing that happened in Tsekho, uh, when was it, 2009 or so? My friend was there. I wasn't there, but my friend was there. Somebody got the plague. So their dog ate a marmot. The dog got the plague. The person who owned the dog is burying, their do burying the dog. They get the plague. They die. Their friends get the plague from them. And then the CDC comes in, right? Because this is shortly after SARS. And they quarantine that off. Like, a champ, you know, uh, we're, we were sort of down on our quarantine game clearly when it came to our responses to COVID-19, but China has been quarantining things ever since 2003, right? It, I, and again, Mason's book goes into this in quite a bit of detail. Um, and so the response, the understanding of plague as, as, to speak to your second question is the language of the CDC, right? Is basically, we need to quarantine this off. We need to make it contained. That's the government response. And the, the person who, uh, has the plague might not even necessarily be thinking about it. Um, I, I, I don't have access to people who catch the plague, so we don't get to hear their voices. Obviously, they would not be using the necessarily be using the language of the CDC themselves. My guess is this image here was created by a Tibetan person in China. I don't know. I just saw it on WeChat. But the fact that they're using Weisheng makes me think they might be thinking about these older models of the Fang Yijan from the 70s and 80s, right, from the kind of Cultural Revolution era. Um, but another piece to think about, too, is one reason I got turned on to this Chime de Zibumba is uh, this is how Tibetan doctors were talking about the coronavirus. Is basically there are two main responses. One is let's make some pills, and two, let's talk about the Chime de Zibumba. So I, I didn't get into the later history of it, but even though I would argue this text is a very vernacular text, so for example, the black triad I've argued is a vernacular term, a vernacular understanding of bubonic plague. This text is also used for subsequent diseases. So for example, when smallpox ravishes central Tibet uh, with the incursion of the, the Jungars and various other Mongol groups in the, the 17th and 18th century and the Panchen Lamas refusing to go because of smallpox, all that sort of thing. This text is, is popular during that time. And the reason for that is really the divine pride. It, it is this Vajra armor. So if you just Google Vajra armor right now, you will find uh, empowerments and rituals built around these very practices. And I would argue this is the locus classicus of those practices in, in this Chime Dutibumba. So anyways, it, it's all um, just to say there are many narratives operating simultaneously. We get the CDC, we get the Weisheng, the 
uh, sanitization public, what, what's the word? Um, I, I guess, yes, yeah, sanitary. Uh, I feel like there's another word that I, it, it, my mind is, is, is missing. But in any case, um, Wei Sheng approaches, and then we also get Chime Dutsubumba, and we also get scholastic methods that Dr. Nance brought up. So people might think through the four tantras and even the Ashtanga Hudaya Samhita, all operating all at the same time. And then one, I, I told you I wouldn't talk about them, but we can come back to this, this idea of poison. Right? Sometimes these diseases are just called poison, duke, right? And that there's duke going around is another way to think about it. So there are these layers of narratives all operating simultaneously, and you really just have to see what the individual happens to be talking about at that moment. Hygiene, yeah, A in the chat, hygiene. That is what I was going for, thank you. <laughs> so we encourage everyone to practice uh, good hygienic practices and um, Thank you, uh, Bill, for a fantastic talk. Um, thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for coming. Wonderful. Yeah, and uh, please email me. I don't have my email address here, but if anybody, if you're curious about any sources or anything I brought up, I'm happy to happy to talk more. So please don't don't be shy and feel free to get in touch.